into the first movement of a concerto where he wrote three additional movements um, of completely new material that didn't have anything to do with the movie. And in the third movement of the Red Violin Concerto, he has the violin make the sound of a wooden flute. Um, basically, usually when we play on the string of the violin, our bow is either, um, well, it's normally in the middle of the string, more or less, um, halfway in between the fingerboard and the bridge. If we get a lip, so that's a... If we go a little bit closer to the fingerboard, we get a little bit more covered sound that we call tasto. And if we go a little bit closer to the bridge, we get a, a shimmery or scratchy sound. If we play it lightly, we get this um, very interesting sound. Kind of whistly. Of course, if we play loud, we get a really scratchy. Wouldn't really do that so much in classical music, but it's great for heavy metal distortion. Anyway, that is our usual playground, halfway in between the bridge or fingerboard, or slightly more to one side or the other. But John Corleano, in this red violin concerto, has us do something that I've never seen a violin do before. He actually has us put the bow on the fingerboard. Now the problem with that is that you're either going to bump the side of the violin or you're going to bump the next string over. So the solution to that is to put a higher finger on the D string while fingering the notes of the G string to kind of get that D string out of the way. Um, before I demonstrate how cool that sounds, I'm going to invite my daughter Sylvia um, back to the show. Good morning, Sylvia. Hello. <laughs> well, just a few weeks ago, um, actually, we let's just stand right here because you're going to play this by yourself in one sec. Um, just a few weeks ago, Sylvia started Recorder, and I have to give a big shout out to Seattle Historical Arts for Kids. They have all kinds of amazing online classes. For years and years, I've always thought, oh darn, I love living in Chicago, but too bad we don't have anything like Shaq. But now, we can take all of their classes online. So Sylvia's done, what have you done? Medieval singing, medieval drumming, medieval calligraphy, medieval improv, I'm gonna do a Shakespeare class next month and three weeks ago she started Renaissance Recorder. So since this is the only wind instrument in the house and the only person who plays it, even though she's only been doing it for a few weeks, I asked her to play a few notes and um, so that you can hear the violin pretending to be a wind instrument right after hearing an actual wind instrument. So take it away. I want to play you go for my window. All right. Thank you, Sylvia. That was very brave to play such a new instrument in public. And Sylvia will be back later in the show to play not a new instrument. And here is the violin pretending to be a wooden flute from the Carigliano Concerto. Isn't that uncanny? Um, I've never heard a violin sound like that. All right, well, on to our compositions for solo violin. Um, the first one is by my dear friend, the great Chicago blues man, um, Corky Siegel, one of the great all-time blues harmonica players. He also plays piano and sings. Actually, it's a really interesting backstory because um, I first met Corky in, um, oh gosh, the early 90s uh, when he was, when his blues band was playing a concerto for blues band and symphony with the Grand Park Orchestra here in town. Um, and that story goes back to the 70s when Seiji Ozawa, the conductor of the Chicago Symphony at Ravinia, used to go to a particular blues bar and listen to the Siegel Schwal Band. And one day he said, would your band like to jam with my band? And that's what led to the composing of this concerto for blues band and symphony orchestra, which was premiered with the Chicago Symphony. Um, since then, it's been recorded with the San Francisco Symphony and played all over the, the world, actually. Um, well, what was interesting is that um, before that, Corky Siegel hadn't had much um, of an encounter with classical music, but he was 
really hooked and he really um, loved classical after that and started doing his own projects with classical that he now calls Chamber Blues. It's an amazing chamber ensemble for classical string quartet plus blues harmonica slash piano and some percussion and they've been going for a number of years now. Lots of amazing compositions. This particular piece for solo violin arose out of that project. Um, but on a personal note, Corky and I go way, way back because my parents used to go to that same blues bar that, that Seiji Ozawa used to go to um, long before I was born, when they were a young married couple before I came along and spoiled their fun. Um, and so I grew up with albums, LP, records of the Siegel Schwal band as a little kid. So it was really cool that my parents' favorite blues band turned out to have the very blues composer who turned out to like classical music. Um, and I was so honored to bring things full circle when Corky Siegel generously played for my wedding. Um, all right, so this is Corky Siegel's Opus 11. And if you know Corky, it makes perfect sense that it is not, in fact, his 11th opus. And the violin gets to, you know, sort of blend blues and classical, but specifically imitate the blues harmonica.
violin as blues harmonica in Opus 11 by Corky Siegel. And if you're not familiar with Corky, be sure to check out his blues band, the Siegel Schwalb Band, and of course his classical meets the blues project, Chamber Blues. All right, well, I guess we're going back in the centuries today. That was the 20th. Now we're going to um, revert to the 19th. I'm going to swap out for a real live early tourist. This is the kind of bow that Paganini used. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a classical bow, meaning not classical music, but the classical period that was in between the Baroque and Romantic periods. Sometimes referred to as a transitional bow because it was the bow that transitioned us from the Baroque bow to the regular modern bow. Um, and it's very, very lucky to have um, an actual real live early tourist because it has a different sound and, and more importantly, a different action. Um, and makes all of the original bowings of the Paganini Caprices um, just work more easily. Not that, they're, not that it makes them easy, but at least it's a little less hard with this bow in my hand um, and a little more satisfying too. My violin, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, was made by the same maker in the same year as Paganini. Um, the one big difference is I do not have it strung with gut as Paganini would have. It'd be super fun to do that someday, but then I'd have to stick to only a narrow slice of repertoire for the duration. So, um, But we've got the bow, and that should bring us pretty close. I'm going to, of course, play Paganini's Caprice number no. 9, because that's the one where he uh, specifically writes into the score that the main section is supposed to imitate a pair of flutes and a pair of horns. So here are the flutes. And here are the horns. By the way, if you happen to be a violinist and happen to be learning the caprices and happen to be using the Galamian edition, please burn it. No, I'm, I don't quite mean that. It's great to get different edited editions to get fingering ideas, but unfortunately the Galamian edition has a lot of errors wrong notes, occasionally wrong rhythms, and so on, lots and lots of them. And so it's very, very important to learn the caprices from an Urtext edition. There are great ones by Henley and Darren Reiter to see what Paganini actually wrote, especially in terms of the bowings. Um, the, the original bowings are so interesting in this caprice, and if you get an edition where they've been completely eliminated without mention, then you don't know what it actually is supposed to be. Now, whether or not you choose to do it is up to you, but at least know what it is. Um, and the original bowing in this caprice for the second section is actually these long slurs, which at first seem rather awkward, but actually make a much more singing musical line. <laughs> if you were to do a normal bowing that a less imaginative composer might have come up with, something like this. Then, of course, that would be very fiery and very virtuosic, but it almost seems like Paganini's not going for virtuosity there. He's going for melody, and um, it, it really makes it, um, I don't know, much more, much more pretty to use those long slurs. Um, okay, so this is actually in a rondo form. It's his only caprice in rondo form. Rondo meaning that there's a main section, the beginning section returns again and again throughout the piece. So you have your flutes and horns, and then you have a, a B section, if you will, and then your flutes and horns again, and then a C section, and then finally, once, one last time, your flutes and horns. And of course, Paganini was very, very inspired by the tradition of Italian opera. And you can hear that all through his compositions. Some of the slow movements of his violin concertos sound exactly like arias. You can almost imagine words being put to them. And in the caprices, there's a lot of that inspiration. Here with the flutes and horns, it definitely is conjuring up um, you know, the 19th century ideas of masculine and feminine, and the, with the flutes, of course, being the girls. And um, I'm very happy to say that at the very end of the Caprice, the women do get the last word. So here is Paganini's Caprice number nine.
caprice number nine. So much drama. Well, for our final woodwind-inspired classical piece, well, I guess it's not really classical. I should say woodwind-inspired violin piece, because we are going to go non-classical to wrap up, and we're going to go 18th century. Sylvia's going to join me for a little more Scottish fiddling. Um, you probably heard her last week with our medley of jigs. This time we're going to do a traditional Scottish MSR, as it's called. It's the most popular kind of Scottish medley, March Strathspe Reel. In the 18th century, the English had banned the bagpipe. I know that sounds like a joke. Many people will say, maybe the bagpipe should still be banned. I have to admit, I love the sound of the bagpipe. In fact, other than heavy metal, it's the other kind of music that I love to crank up really, really loud. It definitely gets your blood rushing. Um, well, when the bagpipe was banned, it was, a, it was a ban of a lot of cultural things, including the tartan. So, of course, Sylvia is wearing her tartan dress today um, because we're playing bagpipe music. Um, the violin um, actually preserved a lot of the repertoire of the bagpipe because people started to play that music on the fiddle and started to really incorporate a lot of bagpipe-style ornaments, which is what gives Scottish fiddling its special sound. So the pipe march I'm going to play is an anonymous march from the 1740s um, in its fiddle version. Uh, and Sylvia is going to be kind enough to give me the drone, which if you thought the ostinato eight notes of the Pachelbel's canon cello part was boring to play over and over, well, poor Sylvia has to play exactly two notes over and over. Um, <laughs> you can put your violin down for a sec. <laughs> but um, thankfully, she's generously agreed to do so because it sounds so cool. Now, the, the Strathspe and Reel that we're going to finish up with are not particularly pipish, um, but we, we couldn't do an M without doing an SR to make an MSR. And so we're going to do a Strathspe, which is really, um, of all the styles of Scottish fiddling, Strathspe is the one that's particularly unique to Scotland, because you can find Irish reels and Irish jigs and whatever else, but only Scotland has the Strathspe. And then this reel is one from my Scottish Fantasies album with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. Um, the amazing Scottish fiddler Alistair Fraser served as my dialect coach when I recorded the Brook and the Mackenzie Concertos. Um, and then he was kind enough to join me for a twin fiddle medley um, that I orchestrated. It was my first time writing music for wind instruments. Boy, was that intimidating, but so cool to hear. Um, and so this was the final reel from our medley of Scots tunes from that album. And I made this twin fiddle version for Alistair and me to play. And, Ever since Sylvia started violin six years ago, I've been waiting for her to play it with me, and it's such a treat that we can finally do it. So um, here is our March Thrasfe Reel, and welcome, Sylvia. Thank you.
channel you can check out um, a serenata that we recorded for tonight's Drink and Diddle School of Scottish Fiddling faculty concert. It's a four movement classical work by the great Scottish Baroque composer James Oswald that we recorded on our Baroque violins. All right well thank you for checking out the violin as it pretended to be the bagpipe, the horns, the <laughs> flutes, and the, um, ba the harmonica and even a wooden flute <laughs> next week on Family Fridays. We're going to pay homage to the guitar. People sometimes ask me, why don't you play the guitar? Well, I don't need to play the guitar, I play the violin. <laughs> and because the violin can do anything, the guitar can do basically. So I'm gonna play a couple of pieces um, that are inspired by the Spanish guitar tradition, the acoustic guitar. And then I'm gonna play a couple of pieces that have to do with the electric guitar, but they're still classical. So be sure to check it out next week. Thanks so much for watching.